this money. Um, all right, uh, Mark's giving me another great introduction. Um, as you all know, uh, I've been farming for many years, and um, I do a lot of different crops, and coffee has been uh, a, a very unique crop from anything else I grow from avocados and cherimoyas. So I stand up here today to talk to you about um, why I got into this, what we've learned go through this. This is really 10 years of a lot of work we've put together, and it's some of it's been kind of a happy accident because we've really had a development of a specialty coffee market, which Lindsay will uh, touch on uh, after my presentation. So first, um, I was working with Mark because my farm was doing cherimoys and avocados. It was a wonderful uh, mix. I had cherimoys as my winter crop. I had avocados as a summer crop. I was, had a cash flow gap. I was looking for something in the fall. We were working with lychees and longans, and he gave me these, uh, these coffee plants which I planted in, really had no idea when they would actually fruit, if they would do that. So the cash flow, that's one reason why we have diversified farms. Uh, the next thing I was looking at was a layered system. Uh, I had no real idea of how to plant coffee, so I put them under the avocados because I was told this uh, would be, uh, uh, that being coffee can handle shade and companion crops. Uh, but what's kind of evolved into is a layered agricultural system in which we are trying to maximize basically our cubic meter of production. We're no longer trying to push the yield of avocados uh, from like, where can we get record-breaking yield of avocados? But what we're trying to do as farmers is to get the most profit and revenues from our acre of land, or I say cubic meter because we're trying to grow at different layers. So just trying to look at the land and be resource efficient. Uh, we say shade loving, and I kind of look at this picture, and you can see that these are in shade. But originally, it was a shade loving plant, and that was part of the companionship that we saw with avocados. Um, by a show of hands, how many avocado growers do we have in here? Great. So we have about 17, 18. Well, as you know, uh, the, the groves are all different um, layouts. Some are terraced, some are berms, some are just laid out 30 feet, some are 12 feet apart. So every little system is different. But what, one thing that really bothered me about some of the avocados is taking care of all the land in between. And that was the opportunity I was trying to do is say, well, if I'm taking care of and cultivating that, that land, let's grow something there. Um, the other thing, I'd say no soil prep, but there's a little soil prep, but you don't have to do like if you're doing wine grapes as an extreme example. Um, we prep a hole, we use the, uh, the, the mature ground under avocado is the plant, uh, our coffee plant. Um, we put sphagnum peat moss, like Mark said, and we just plant right in there. We don't have to rip, you don't have to pull things out, you don't have to, uh, my basic point is the, the land development cost is rather minor at this stage. Um, I think that's important when we diversify our crops so we're not uh, getting uh, sunk into capital investment, especially like the maybe fruit tree crops and vineyard crops where it takes five years to get into steady state cash flow production. So those are all very important. Now, the biggest thing uh, and why we would ever plant a new crop is making sure that we have a market. I would never stand up here and say plant something and let's make the market. The market has to exist and the trend for market development has to be there looking 10 years out. It's the reality of being a tree fruit farmer. So my vision is a combination of California wine country, wine industry, uh, combined with the Kona coffee. Um, starting with the Kona coffee, it's more from a production standpoint. Um, they've been doing it for many years. Uh, they have high land costs, high labor costs. Some of them have water issues. Uh, but they really have developed the plan because they've been doing it a lot longer uh, when it comes to uh, cost and gain you know, a price that's 35 to $50 a pound return. That's really what we're trying to look at. It's not much different uh, than uh, what uh, we're doing here in California. In fact, I think we can be a lot more efficient than a lot of the growers in Hawaii. Sorry, if you're in Hawaii. But <laughs> the more important part is the California wine country because it's like, welcome to wine country. Things are done differently here. We have a, a, a vibrant wine industry in which people are spending uh, a lot of money for wine. Um, the, I feel like we're at where wine was 25 years ago. Uh, one example is we have 13 varieties of coffee, and that 
cherry that you just passed around, the Katura cherry. If you come up here and try the yellow one and try this Bourbon, you'll have different flavor components. Well, people that drink wine also drink coffee. They recognize it like a Pinot. Well, they may like a Katura. They may like a Pacamara. There's a whole opportunity that is beginning to develop, and we hope to be the developers of this, of developing vintages or, or varietals out there. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of post-harvest options. So we're combining these two elements here in California to, to further expand the specialty market, but to get our costs uh, and, and to farm as efficiently as possible. Okay, so uh, my farm is a great example, you know, to where we are today. Um, I've been doing it for a, a dozen years, but really in the last three years we've come, I keep saying, out of the closet that I'm a coffee grower. Uh, and that's because we, you know, we, we've gotten great cupping scores. Um, but our goal right now is to understand how we can expand it. So first you gotta know what I'm doing. So first the aspect. I am just north of Santa Barbara. Uh, the coffee is grown at elevation between 300 and 650 feet. And elevation doesn't matter. Here, here it doesn't matter with what we're doing. Yes, um, I might as well say why. So in cough, if Mark uh, explained that the, the, the maturation of the uh, fruit from flower to uh, harvest is generally six months in the tropics. Um, as you slow down the maturation, quality increases. So you slow it down by putting it in shade or putting it up higher in mountains where they have colder nights, cooler days. Well. With what they use with uh, altitude, we use with latitude. Our flowering starts in summer and our harvest starts in summer. So we are up to 12 months sometimes in maturation period. Some of the longest maturation periods in the world. Think of a wine grape being on the vine for eight to nine months or 10 months. It, it would be a whole different flavor complexity. That is, I think, one of the things that's happening to us. Um, going back to what uh, of my of my property, uh, the layout. I have six by eight planting all the way through the avocados. I scurried up my avocados, so I have everything that's above five feet to uh, 18 feet to avocado production. We have coffee down below. I do have some dragon fruit and passion fruit as I'm experimenting with other layered systems, but right now we're focused on the coffee. Um, soil type. It's a sesame loam. It's a clay loam some parts of uh, a little bit of sandstone enter, turning into a, a regular well. We do have some clay soils. You walk out there after the rain, you have an inch of clay on the bottom of your feet. Um, it's all on a slope about uh, 10, uh, 4 to 10 percent. Um, the avocados have been there for 25, 30 years, so there's some, some places have uh, very mature soils. I've planted in the shade and out of the shade. So half of my crop is in full sun. Um, I just wanted to see what would happen. And uh, we haven't noticed a quality difference yet. Uh, we noticed um, some irrigation differences. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, you know, the water use, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. You know, if you're in full sun, you're using more than more, more because it's transpiring. As you go in the shade, it's using less and it's gained uh, a lot more of the subsurface movement of the irrigation water from the avocados. And that was kind of my goal, was to make sure that the avocados and coffee were working together. So we know it can happen in Santa Barbara. We can grow coffee. We've been now trying to expand it. Uh, we want to expand coffee production. Uh, we wanted to test different locations. So our first location that we were trying to do is within Santa Barbara. This is the first ranch I planted four years ago called Gibson Ranch in Carpinteria. It's about two miles back from the ocean. It butts up against the Los Padres National Park. They're probably about 400 feet up. Uh, as you see, uh, it's, a, uh, it's an organic avocado production. They have uh, burned rows. And we planted three coffee plants in between the trees on the south side of the trees. Uh, this was one of our first plantings. The grower was not as experienced. Uh, she, they relied on. Um, there you go. Oh. They relied a lot more on their farm managers, who um, were somewhat skeptical that coffee could grow. Uh, they since they got a new farm manager, the coffee's doing really well. We're now in production. Um, 
they had this struggle a little bit about planting. They planted too deep, and there's a well, there's a quite a learning experience. But they have about 750 trees and about to expand more. <coughs> Um, this is Pike's Ranch. This is a whole different scenario. I call this my acid test because um, Pike is a, a wonderful guy, but he's in the construction business. He wanted to do coffee, and then this fire came through and burned his whole farm down. And he said, let's plant coffee. And I warned him. I said, you know, full sun. I have some experience. And he saw my full sun. So we did this full sun planting. He's never there. He puts everything on automation. He barely cares for it. And it grows. And we had produced some really nice coffee last year. Um, it's nowhere near optimal, but I kind of like it because you just see what happens if you kind of ignore it. And it's in full sun. It has more of an east aspect to it. And, uh, but we have the same type of water. I think the property's for sale. Anyways, uh, so this is Shanley Farms. This is Morro Bay. So we went further north with coffee. We're now pushing the limits here. Uh, this is an avocado farm, and I use avocados because they're a good indicator for frost-free environment. Also, there's a soil symbiosis going on. We love the pH soils, just like uh, the same pH for, for avocado, six and a half, seven. And this is a, a terrace slope south side. We just planted every eight feet uh, coffee uh, along the south side. We'll plant another 2,000 trees uh, this next year. Uh, he, his trees do really well because he has a pH meter in which he is irrigating 6.5 every time with P and a lot of his trees just do really well by regulating that. Um, and finally, uh, this is Milano's, this is the Oceanside Flower Farm. This is a picture we took yesterday, it's a planting we did late last summer. <laughs> Uh, fascinating full sun location. It's right there between, it's right next to Legoland. Full sun, but it has a beautiful ocean view. Uh, it's a very sandy soil, and they went for it because they're doing a whole um, direct marketing farm stand. Um, they're good farmers, and it was interesting to see, except for the fact that you can see we have some chlorosis when we showed up yesterday, and that's an iron issue, but one of the uh, critical elements, let's get a close up on the plant, is they planted them three inches too deep. It's okay for tomatoes, maybe. But you know, it took me a few, a few minutes to figure it out, and I was, I was realizing the tags were missing. Where are all the tags on this? And I started digging, and we can find the tags that were buried. So, and you can see there's a little bit of um, breakdown in the, in the cambium, and, and so I think that was one of the critical elements. But, uh, with some chelating iron and getting these pulled away, I think they'll do fine. But it's one of uh, our furthest southern plantings here. Are, are these guys uh, sensitive to boron? Um, no, I, I, they're not. In fact, sometimes I have a little lack of boron in a few of my situations. But I haven't had any boron toxicity. Now, this is hard to see here, but um, there's a guy named Ruben Hofshi who's uh, with Del Rey, but he has our coffee plants in Fallbrook for 24 years. Uh, we harvested some last year, and he, he went and picked me some, and I think in the next month we'll be cupping it. But um, here, here's an example, and he totally uh, leaves them alone. You can't even see them in here because uh, it's in a part where he plants everything over the years, and he just says, yeah, it always grows, does well. And that's that's good indicator. We tried to see them yesterday, but uh, Ruben was a little bit on the, on the busy side. Okay, so we looked at uh, cultivation examples. Now let's get down to the nitty gritty, the cost of production. And that uh, these are examples and assumptions that we're developing on our farm. From the cost to the revenues, we were looking at um, trying to figure out what assumptions we can we can base on on a five year old tree. Um, can you make a little bigger? I don't know if I can. We have handouts on the back table to the left of the door. So world production of coffee is about 10 pounds of cherries per tree. Kona is about 15 pounds. Well, I think we're, we're 20 pounds, right? Um, I have trees that this year did 65 
to 40 pounds. Um, and those are the ones that kind of let wild and grow, and now they're a little bit more alternate bearing. Uh, one of the reasons I think we can get higher yields is because we irrigate. Literally, we irrigate. When you plant most of the world's coffee is, I don't want to say dry farm, but non-irrigated land. And where they rely on rain for eight months of the year, and there's a dry period. Here, I give it water all the time. And in fact, in that water, I inject a little bit of fertilizer, whether it be fish or potassium or whatever. So we give it precise irrigation. Most of the world, when they fertilize, they throw a triple 15 on top and wait for the rains to come. We're a little bit, have the ability to be more precise. Um, when you talk about cherries, uh, eight pounds of red cherry translates into one pound of dry product. We call it green beans. Ratio can change a little bit based on uh, varietals and moisture content. Our ultimate goal is.